Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, I want to thank the organizers. Oh, uh, we had some cancellations uh, kind of late in the program, and so uh, Andrea Dimitri nominated Lara and I to give talks. But uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and hear all the interesting things going going. So uh, this is going to be a talk in two parts. Uh, in the first part, I'm going to tell you about a continuation of some work that we've been doing with uh, kind of a new way of doing tariff spectroscopy in very large magnetic fields in which we can induce cyclotron resonance in materials that are, uh, typically this would be, would be possible with conventional uh, ways of doing that, smaller magnetic fields made possible. It's really a, a unique experimental system that with a collaboration at Los Alamos. And I'm also going to tell you about recent tariff spectroscopy measurements that we've done on a heavy fermion material, cerium cobalt indium-5. And, uh, and point out that measurements of the very low frequency conductivity reveal features that show that this uh, system can be interpreted as being consistent with being a Fermi liquid uh, despite linear and T resistivity. Okay, before I do that, let me uh, thank the various people that made this possible. Um, the work on the coup rates was done, this is not working or it needs to be turned on. Is there another pointer? Is that a pointer? Huh? That's good. This, this will be fine. Um, so uh, the work on the coup rates was done in collaboration with... Uh, huh? Oh, okay. Um, the work in uh, coup rates was done in collaboration with uh, Scott Croker and his former postdoc, Kirk Post, at Los Alamos. Uh, Kirk really just built a remarkable system, which I think is going to be a vast use for experiments like this over the coming years. Uh, the expertise on coup rates was brought by my former postdoc, Anel Legros, and uh, Scott Croker, of course, was instrumental in this and approached me some years ago after they built the system, asking what else did they think uh, we might be able to measure with it, and I had these uh, intermediate thoughts about what we could do on coup rates, and very fortunate to continue collaborating with Ivan Bozovich and members of his group at, at Brookhaven. Uh, I'll also tell you about heavy fermions, and that work was headed by my current postdoc, uh, Liu Shi, uh, these two guys uh, I've been fortunate to know for 25 years, and that's where our first papers go back to, and uh, collaborating with them again. Uh, the films grown in a collaboration between Cornell and Los Alamos, and Daryl Schlamm and, and Kyle Shen's group, and uh, the, the support has come from these organizations. So I'd like to start with making some kind of philosophical points, and, and I don't expect uh, these philosophical points to be particularly deep, considering the, the audience that I have here, but I wanted to get us all on the same page. I show this plot very often to students when I give lectures on optical spectroscopy. Uh, it's both, a, I think, a very good plot and a bad plot. Uh, I'll tell you what it is. So it is a plot of the uh, a measure of the mass measured with optics versus the heat capacity on a lot of different material systems, right? You can see sodium down at the bottom, weakly interacting metal, some maybe uh, more interesting things, niobium and iron in the middle, all the way up to heavy fermions at the top. And the point is that uh, there's a linear proportionality between these two different measures of the mass. And I would point out these two different measures are very different experiments, right? To plot the data on the bottom, this is a plot of basically it's the heat capacity, so it's a measure of how energy is absorbed into a material. And on the vertical scale, a very different experiment where you're essentially measuring the inertia of systems, shaking charge carriers and, and seeing what their inertia is. And so it's a good plot because it illustrates something that we like to illustrate to students, and that's this notion of a quasi-particle, that despite interactions, electron-electron, electron-phonon, uh, electron interactions with local moments, all of this kind of conspires to give us, in the end, in situations like this, uh, renormalized quasi-particles, but nevertheless renormalized quasi-particles. It's a bad plot because it overstates the case for what we might actually believe. Uh, for one thing, it's log-log, and there's a lot of scatter, but um, uh, the other aspect is that even within the level of Fermi liquid, we don't necessarily expect that if we have an experiment that we've interpreted in the context of, of quasi-particles and infer a mass from that, that those masses will be the same for different, for very different experiments, right? So quantum oscillations and uh, heat capacity experiments might measure some kind of thermodynamic mass, which is sensitive to the density of states of the Fermi energy. Angle resolve photo emission could measure, let's say, velocities around different parts of the Fermi surface, and these might be related to each other but we can have things like susceptibility and compressibility, which even at the level of Fermi liquid theory aren't sensitive to electron-phonon interactions, but become sensitive to electron-electron interactions. There's also cyclotron resonance experiments, which, as I'll discuss more, give very, very different uh, considerations. 
Um, but the point is that um, uh, what, why this is a bad plot is that it misses the point that, in fact, comparing different ways of measuring mass can give us insight uh, uh, about the underlying physics in different systems. Uh, well, units are different. So this is a uh, heat capacity in millijoules per mole Kelvin squared, and then the, 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 yeah. what's that? Well, it's the units are different, right? So that's the major thing. Yeah. Um, okay. That's um, okay. So uh, I give my conclusions at the beginning. So when I invariably run out of time, you've seen them. Uh, I'll talk about the coupe rates, and uh, we have uh, exploited this this new capability, large pulse magnetic fields couple of time domain terrorist spectroscopy, and there are many opportunities for charge and spin systems. Uh, these experiments could not be done, I think, with any other way of, of doing the experiments than the way that we've done them now, other optical experiments, other ways of doing magnetic field. And uh, we observe a cyclotron resonance that's uh, despite the broad line shape and the coupe rates. And these kinds of experiments give complementary information to quantum oscillations. Uh, and uh, significantly different cyclotron masses are observed in the coupe rates than found with heat capacity. In heavy fermions, I'm going to make the claim that uh, when we measure the scattering rate of the heavy quasi particles in cerium cobalt five, and this is Fermi liquid like despite the linear and T resistivity, and I'll circle those guys so you can kind of, take, those are the two key takeaway points from all of this. So let me start with Coupe rates, uh, and in particular the cyclotron resonance experiments. Okay, so cyclotron resonance is a semi classical effect. So we're going to imagine a charged system putting in a large magnetic field. With velocity, of course, they're going around, feeling a Lorentz force. Uh, easy freshman physics exercise to show that they have a frequency that goes like EB over M, where B is the magnetic field and M is a mass. Uh, the optical conductivity for such a system is uh, characterized, let's say, if we have zero magnetic field, we would be characterized this by a peak, like a Lorentzian peak, which is peaked at zero frequency. Uh, you're going to see a number of times in this plot, in this talk, that I'm going to plot the response of the system in terms of the response to left and right circularly polarized light. Okay, I'll talk a little bit more about that. We actually measure in terms of linearly polarized light, but then we can transform into whatever basis we like for this. And I'm going to represent left and right as positive frequencies and negative frequencies in this fashion. It turns out to be a very convenient way to do it. And one of the reasons it's convenient is that our familiar Druda expression in this in x and y coordinates is very complicated in the field, but in uh, right and left coordinates it's super simple. You just shift the, the Druda peak to omega c, the cyclotron frequency. That's at the level of the Druda theory. Okay, so, so there's a resonance in Eb over m, and again, you can understand this is just essentially a classical effect. It's maybe in some ways more powerful than quantum oscillations because you don't need quantum coherence. So the electrons just have to complete part of a loop to, uh, to go around. And you can imagine, again, electrons going around, and you're just kind of kicking them every time they come by. So resonance at EB over M, but what's the M in this? And so that's an interesting issue. Um, EB over M is, of course, the inverse time to complete a Fermi surface orbit, but, but what M? And so what do we know? Well, we know a few things. Uh, some of this was alluded to earlier in the week in, in Sabir's talk. Uh, in a Galilean invariant system, uh, Walter Cohn, in this famous paper, 1961, showed that the mass is independent of interaction, interactions. Right? So that's really quite you know remarkable thing. You could have a strongly interacting electronic system where it's just a soup of electrons, but you measure the bare electronic mass. Okay? If we have a non-interacting system, but let's say maybe some complicated band structure, then you can show, with a maybe complicated Fermi surface, then you can show that the cyclotron mass is the derivative of, let's say, the derivative of the energy, the inverse the derivative of the energy with respect to the Fermi surface, Fermi surface area. Okay, so that's another nice result that comes out in a non-interacting system. If we have, say, some system with effective Galilean invariance, maybe like some low-density system where Fermi wavelengths are really, really large as compared to the lattice constant, then uh, it's been shown, let's say, in a 2D electron gas or something like that, then the cyclotron mass is not the bare mass, but you have this effective Galilean invariance where it's essentially the band mass. And so this has been exploited in semiconductor systems, 2D electron gases. Now, of course, what we're interested in is when we put on strong interactions, and that's where we don't know very much. Uh, what is known is some general things, deviations from Galilean invariance, and say, in the form of disorder, non-parabolicity, umklopf scattering, can cause electron-electron-electron phone interactions to manifest. 
Uh, there's very little theory here. I only know about five or six papers, remarkably, in the, in the annals of physics, which, is, which have attacked this. Uh, in the context of 2D electron gases, there was work by Callan, Halperin, McDonnell, and Callan in, in, uh, in 2D electron gases, showing that when you put in disorder into such a system, basically there's some kind of magnetoplasmon mode, which allows the electron-electron the -electron interactions to manifest themselves. Um, there is this paper here, perhaps relevant to the cuprates, Kenki and Yamada, that did kind of a, 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 a simple calculation, but using motivated by the Hubbard model. And as they point out uh, that uh, here, uh, a kind of effective mass corresponding to the ratio of momentum to actual mass flow is enhanced from even the thermodynamic mass of the quasi-particles. And so they point out that you can get different masses from, from a system like this when there's umklop scattering. And then uh, there's this, this is the other paper that I know of, which is, uh, which uh, Sabir had referenced uh, the other day, which is just uh, out in the archive. Okay, so um, we're interested in, I just want to make the general point is that cyclotron mass is uh, something ripe for giving us new information about interacting systems. So what's the experiment we do? The experiment we do is time domain turret spectroscopy in large pulsed magnetic field. I'm not going to talk about the details of this, but uh, really kind of a remarkable setup where we can make in single pulses of a magnet, we can, it's time domain turret spectroscopy. So this is kind of, many of you might have seen these kind of pictures before, perhaps by me. There's an electric field which comes in. It's about a picosecond long. Inverse of a picosecond is a terahertz. So it has all this Fourier component that we're interested in. We can do these experiments now where in a single pulse we get enough information to uh, uh, measure a spectrum. And so in a single pulse of a magnet, here, where this guy's, the field is going up to 30 tesla and then ramping down over the course of milliseconds, we can get boom, 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 five or six samplings of different magnetic fields and then measured all the way out to 30 tesla. And so this is, uh, this is the transmission as a function of frequency on a gallium arsenide quantum well. And uh, this is just the plot of this minimum of different fields lying on this straight line. And EB over M, you can infer the M, and that's the uh, the accepted mass of, of uh, this 2D electron gas gallium arsenide here. Uh, another point that I'll make, and this will come back on the next slide, is that it's in time domain terror spectroscopy. It allows measurements of the complex transmission functions. So there's no Kramer's Kronig transforms or everything, anything that needs to be, uh, that needs to be performed. And we measure in, in a polarized fashion, and then we can take the data, having measured the complex transmission functions, and transform it into whatever basis we like. We could have X and Y. That typically is more complicated for these kinds of experiments. And we like thinking of it in terms of right and left circularly polarized light. And so that's data right here. This is a plot of the real and the imaginary parts of the conductivity as a function of frequency plotted for right polarized light on positive and negative, uh, left polarized light on the negative side. The light blue, that's the data at zero magnetic field, and it's just a symmetric curve around zero frequency, we apply a field to it, and we can see that the maximum is consistent with moving to the positive frequency side, and we can fit the real and the imaginary parts at the same time to the simple model to kind of extract out, if you will, how does that peak move as a function of increasing magnetic field all the way out to 30 Tesla. So really kind of a remarkable thing. This is a completely new regime for being able to do optical spectroscopy. So very yeah. Briefly, the wiggles that we see in the data, is that some systematic error? You repeat the measurement, what do you get? No, that's, that's statistical. That's statistical noise. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Uh, okay, good. So uh, we can take data like that. We can uh, uh, pick out those peaks there. We fit the data, actually. And that's plotted here, cyclotron frequency as a function of the magnetic field at a bunch of different temperatures. And there's some funny temperature dependence in here that's small that we don't understand yet, and I'm not going to concentrate on that. You can see it's kind of non-monotonic. There's the 50K point, 45K is there, and then it comes down to 45K, 40K, backed up to 35. I don't understand this temperature dependence, but it's something that we're very interested in. So that's for a close to optimally doped sample, but we can do this for lots of different materials, and we have at lots of temperatures. And uh, that's a plot of the cyclotron mass as a function of doping over the whole phase diagram. This is plotted you know, mass on this side versus doping. TC here, if you will, to give you some kind of perspective. And the mass, interestingly, just kind of goes monotonically up 
to the highest dopings that we can measure. Okay, uh, this is kind of the range of the experiment we can do. Scattering rates get really large down here, so it's hard to resolve shifts, and the masses are getting large up here, so the shifts get small. And so you know, we get, sometimes experimentalists get lucky because uh, you know the sweet spot of what we'd be interested in actually is is pretty good for the experiment we want to do. Yeah. We also get gamma, yeah. I, maybe you can ask me about it. I want to talk about masses on the basis of time, but we also get gamma, and that actually shows interesting uh, field dependencies as well. Um, I haven't really decided on the, the full story there yet, but, but I can show you the data at the end. Yeah. Okay, so let me come back to what I had discussed. Uh, we want to compare it to other things, and so this is a plot here of, uh, that's the data here, and I apologize for the colors. That's the cyclotron mass there, which is increasing plotted, also plotted here, and again, apologize for the colors, it doesn't come through very well, there are different colors of blue on my screen. Uh, here, that's the mass as inferred from the heat capacity experiments. And so they just, you know, just completely don't match each other, right? It's much bigger on this side and smaller on that side. They cross each other at about uh, 0.27, something like that. And so there just seem to be different quantities altogether. Right? We see no sign of divergences of mass near P star, nor no signs of anything happening at the Lipschitz transition, and shows that any kind of singularities, if they exist, they're, they're too weak to appear in the, to appear in the cyclotron mass. Question. Yeah. What does the simple LDA type theory do for the band mass? Band mass is not one type. Yeah, so, this, so, so that's a good question. Uh, I mean, LDA, I'm not, I don't think LDA is going to be a good... No, 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 but, but let me, uh, I don't think LDA is going to be a good guide for this. And it kind of, we can do it, but I think it's irrelevant. So uh, ZX uh, Shen has a recent experiment, or uh, a very nice parameterization of LSCO band structure, and they actually find that the mass inferred from, so they fit the band structures very accurately, and uh, from that, and then calculate the heat capacity, and it more or less just sits on top. I have a slide there about that. So our masses are different than those. Yeah. This is an important point. Yeah, I agree. Okay, good. Uh, so uh, sorry, that's the final thing I wanted to say. And let me just take a few more minutes now to uh, to talk about the other point, and that's this idea of hidden Fermi liquid in cerium cobalt indium five. So cerium cobalt indium five is uh, you know one of our favorite heavy fermion systems. It's the highest TC heavy fermion superconductor, the TC of, of uh, something of order two Kelvin. That's the plot of the resistivity versus temperature, right? So it has this kind of characteristic behavior coming down, going up to the condo coherence temperature, and then coming, coming down quite quickly there. Once the heavy fermion state forms, there's lots of data in the literature. This is data, I think that's from Jean-Pierre Paglioni's PhD thesis, published now 20 years ago. This is the phase diagram, temperature, magnetic field, and it was emphasized in this work that there's a some kind of quantum critical point that uh, is close to the termination of the superconducting state. The thing that I want to emphasize here is the strong linearity in the zero field data, right? So it's just basically linear, plotted here to 15 Kelvin, actually goes linear to something about 20 Kelvin here. And so this has been claimed to be consistent with non-Fermi liquid behavior at zero magnetic field. And so uh, we were, uh, we're working now, we've been looking for a very long time uh, to, to get uh, uh, high quality thin films of this material, right? So it's the highest TC superconductor, so that should be interesting for us to, uh, uh, to uh, interesting for us to look at. Uh, there's, of course, a lot of work on molecular beam epitaxy of interesting materials. Heavy fermions have not been a favorite material for people to grow films of, but now there's this been concerted effort and collaboration between Los Alamos and the guys at Cornell to do this, and really some kind of wonderful films, and uh, you know, I think there'll be a lot of stuff to come. With films, we can do terahertz spectroscopy on them quite nicely, and so that's plot of the data there to give you a feeling for it. Again, real and imaginary parts of the complex, so it's the complex conductivity, real part, imaginary part is a function of frequency over a large frequency range that starts from high temperature and cools down, and you see this very prominent, there's a long tail out here, uh, but there's a very prominent peak which forms at the lowest frequencies. And so what we've done, and let me just zoom through this quickly, you know, these are just a few different temperatures. I can pick out, let's say, 5 Kelvin, and I can, this is the real and imaginary parts, and I also can put the DC data in here and do a Kramers chronic consistent fit on that, and in this fashion, pull out the width of this feature. Okay? Now, how does one normally get masses from optical conductivity data? Well, there's uh, one of the conventional ways of doing it, and I think we've heard about this earlier in the meeting, is the so-called extended Druda model. 
where it's essentially you have the complex connectivity and you take the imaginary and the real parts, normalize properly with some plasma frequency, which tells you something about the overall spectral weight of the system, and this gives you a frequency-dependent mass and a frequency-dependent scattering rate. So what are these quantities? I mean, this is kind of our definitions, our operative definitions for what are they? Well, uh, you can kind of understand this mass is if you have a feature, like a very narrow feature like we do, sitting on top of a large background, this mass very roughly is the ratio of the whole area to the area just in the Druda. Okay, so you can just kind of look at the areas and get a very rough feeling for what's the mass for normalization. Um, one over tau is the scattering rate, which let's say can be related to the DC conductivity in this fashion here, tau over m sub b, where m sub b is the band mass. Okay, so that gives you some kind of physical feeling for it, but what about the actual width of this feature here? One over tau star, one over tau star is the actual width of this feature itself, which is not the same as one over tau, and so we need to discriminate these. One over tau star is been referred to sometimes as the fully renormalized scattering rate, which has an extra factor of the mass renormalization in it. Okay. So I like, you know, I think of one over tau, it's the scattering rate, but it's really more of a formal quantity. If I really have some, uh, you know, some aspiration for uh, having a, a Boltzmann transport perspective of massive quasi-particle scattering at some time, I should really think of a mass m star and a scattering rate that is based on tau star, not one over tau. Okay? Um, this, uh, uh, I think Chandra will have some questions on this particular point here, but, I, but we can have, let me, I was going to talk about that, but let, on the basis Peter, of on question, let me just go on. What is tau star of omega? The way how tau star is defined is just a number. Uh, where is one over here? Uh-huh. No, well, lambda, no, no, the no, no. lambda the is the way how you defined it, like half width of this red peak. Yeah. It's a so, number. Yeah. It's uh, not a function of frequency. Uh, it, the zero frequency limit of one over tau star okay. is roughly equal to the width of that. I'm just trying to give you some cartoon feeling. So if, if, it, if it doesn't have a large, if, there, if there's over some range, not very large frequency dependencies, then that will be true. Yeah. Okay. So it's the zero frequency limit, roughly. Peter, sorry, but the first plot that you show us about what is a quasi-particle, how was n star estimated in that plot? Because, I mean, in the normal... In what? In what? In the very first plot that you show us, with yeah. the collection of data from any kind of... Uh, yeah, that was some integral over... Similar some, to this one. Yeah, that was an integral over some areas like that. I mean, it's different things on that plot, yeah. It's okay. not made by me, but there were some integrals that were made. Well, I don't think it was extended through the model in any of those cases. Yeah, some inner role using the sum rule at low frequencies. Yeah, okay, I'm, I'm out of time. So let me just show you that. So, so let me, these are different definitions for one over tau, one over tau star, and m star. Um, very often in the optics literature, people con uh, concern themselves with one over tau. And um, uh, there it is from our data. So 40 Kelvin, essentially independent of frequency, maybe with a slight slope. 5K deep into the heavy fermion state, one over tau, as a function of frequency, uh, we can fit it, let's say it has this kind of curved form here, and that dashed line is um, fit to an exponent of n equals two, and we like to do this fit as a function of temperature. You can see that at low temperatures, it's quite consistent with two, which is what you would expect from a Fermi liquid. Now, so it goes like omega squared, good. But how can we rationalize that with a linear and T-resistivity, right? So we have linear and T-resistivity, which has been heralded as non-Fermi liquid behavior, and this, and that's uh, a plot of one over tau here in the zero frequency limit and the green dots, and then rho dc just normalized, and you can see they're on top of each other, and that linearity is this linear and t resistivity that's been discussed. But what the point that I was making is that if we really want to consider the renormalized heavy fermion quasi-particles, we need to take into account one over tau star, right? So again, we're going to talk about masses at all, we have to have some kind of thing in the back of our head about Boltzmann transport, and that's one over tau star right there, which is consistent with a T squared dependence of, uh, let's say, the scattering rate of the fully normalized quasi-particles go like one over T star, and my claim is that the Fermi liquid in this system is hidden uh, in the resistivity by the strong temperature dependence of M star. That's the temperature dependence of M star as a function of temperature there. You can see it is some number of order unity, the ratio at high temperatures, 
and then turns on to something like 25 or 30 at the lowest temperatures. Could you also assign this temperature dependence to the, to the plasma frequency, that is, to the number density? Um, let me just get to my conclusion, and then I'll take that as the first question. Yeah, um, next slide. Okay, good. Um, I just wanted to, let me give you my conclusions, then I'll get to Dimitri's uh, uh, question. So in Coop rates, uh, the thing that I wanted to emphasize was that we get significantly different cyclotron masses than found in the heat capacity, and that's afforded by this new possibilities of doing large magnetic field coupled to time domain terrorist spectroscopy. And the claim I want to make is that the scattering rate of the heavy fermion quasi particles, cerebral cold and neum 5, is fermi liquid like despite the linear and T resistivity. And then I'll just stop there and take questions. Thank you. Okay. So maybe I'll answer that as the first question. Yeah. So uh, the question is uh, could I interpret this? as a strongly temperature dependent uh, uh, density. So in which case then, um, uh, that's a good question, uh, let me think. Um, so the, is a question about the mass, interpreting the mass in this fashion? So my, my, my observation is at some level about one of our tau, what, what, what do I, you said, uh, what am I actually trying to interpret? No, one of our tau star, is in the data is literally just the width of the peak. I can read it off with my eyes. So I don't have to assume anything about anything. But you're assuming that your plasma frequency is temperature independent, right? No. I have something specific to this. Yeah. yeah. So think of bismuth that we measured together. Yeah. Uh, if you have, uh, say, a, a com partly compensated Fermi surfaces, indeed you can have uh, 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 say a, a change of Fermi surface size on sure. the wall and the electron yeah. side. So it could be something like this here, actually. Okay, but I just want to understand what I'm trying to explain with this well, point. If I'm trying to explain, and n becomes temperature dependent. If I'm trying to explain uh, the t squared in the scattering rate, the answer is no, because this is just what, I can just read it off the optical conductivity. I have a peak. Yeah. And I'm following the width of that peak as a function of temperature. Yeah. And it goes like T-squared. The thing that you attribute to M star being temperature dependent could also be the uh, number of, uh, of electrons. Yes, but it doesn't come into the consideration about, yeah. uh, about T, uh, 1 over tau star at all. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So the answer is no. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay, on, your go ahead, yeah. On the cyclotron resonance, um, the temperature dependence that you showed, uh, it was a bit quick, but if I saw it correctly, the mass was not monotonic in temperature. Right. Yeah. Was your, what was, uh, do you have, I don't have any explanation of that, uh -huh. you know, so it, it seemed to be, um, the, the experiments are time intensive. You know, I said we're doing them in milliseconds, but it actually takes, to get good enough data, it takes many shots to the magnet over and over again. So we saw this, we're gonna go back, and we actually have a postdoc who will be living at Los Alamos doing these experiments now, and so that's something we really wanna to get to the bottom of. Uh, you know, we were looking for things like log T renormalizations in the mass, and there was some weird non-monotonic non dependence that seemed to be beyond any scatter, but yet, you know, it was kind of up, down, up, and you know, I didn't have anything sensible to say about that, so I, I won't. But okay. Thank you. I think it's interesting, and whether that's, um, it's notable, and whether it's interesting or not, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I have a couple of comments. One is that uh, the behavior of the mass that you find, which increases with, uh, with doping, is really intriguing and counterintuitive with respect to any picture related to strong correlations. Yeah. Because, yeah. And um, on the other hand, the fact that you get an excess of uh, M star from a specific heat in a range which is intermediate, around P star, let's say, although it is rather broad, yeah could perhaps be attributed to the fact that the specific heat, which is the source of this uh, data, could get some contribution from non-fermionic excitation, so, so from bosonic yeah. things. I, I so, have a comment on that, but go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. Yeah, so, so I think that, yes, in principle, you're right, there could be other contributions, but I think that the, the Shen data shows that, no, that's not the case. So fit the angle result. So there was a claim by Louis Taifer in a series of very nice papers where they, the claim was that the heat capacity showed an extra big peak beyond what you could explain from the band, you know, parameterizing the band structure. But those were older parameterizations. And so, you know, I, I, I believe the new parameterizations, and it seems to me within the error bars, you calculate what the heat capacity you expect for the band structure you have with new photo emission data, and it's 
right on. So. Yeah, but, uh, just a question which connects to what Dmitry and Jörg was asking. So if you would add resonance, extract a different effective mass from the plasma frequency, how, by how much that would differ from your... Which experiment are we talking about? Yeah, uh, first part of your... Oh, in the cyclotron. Yeah, cyclotron mass, mm -hmm. but you would, let's say, you sit at the resonance and you extract at the peak uh, from the plasma frequency that effective mass, how that would differ from your cyclotron mass. Yeah, so... Um, in order to do that, mm -hmm. uh, I need to know the, um, so, so the area of the, I'll say some things that you know, but just to get everybody on the same page, uh, the area of, the, of this conductivity peak uh -huh. is proportional to the density, the, the, the density of the carriers divided by the mass. So I need to know the density of carriers, uh -huh. right? And so I can make an assumption about that. I can assume that they're uh -huh. given by the Hall effect at high temperature, or I can assume they're given by how many dopants there. I can use, I could integrate the signal to very high frequencies, and I could uh, compare it with the LDA, you know, get some insight from LDA. I could use LDA to give me a calculated plasma frequency. So I need density okay. in some point. Okay. And so quickly, so you also showed this comparison with specific heat and yeah. cyclotron mass, but presumably there are also measurements of penetration depth. I just wonder whether that effective mass, how, how that other effective mass would enter here. Uh, so, so that's a good question. I would be, um, for a simple superconductor, I think that would be a reasonable way. Yeah, yeah, for a simple superconductor, I think that would be a reasonable way of proceeding. Uh, cuprates are, are, are known to have all kinds of issues. And so, for instance, we have papers on overdoped cuprates. Uh, Bozovich showed some years ago that the superfluid density was much smaller than you would expect based on many different ways of doing it. And then the question is, if, where is that spectral weight? And it turns out that at high, uh, at high dopings, it's in this druidal like peak that persists all the way to the lowest temperatures. So I think there's just too many weird things going on to, to use that as a good measure. Perhaps a naive question about the second part. Yeah. So you talk about frequency dependent tau, but at the end of the day you looked at resistivity, which means that it's zero frequency result. Yeah. So yes, you are attributing change between T square and T behavior to M star, which by itself depends on temperature. Yeah which give you one plus lambda at omega equal to zero. Mm -hmm. It's the same factor that appears in specific heat. Yeah. So shouldn't you expect that specific heat should go as T square in this situation? Uh, T times one plus lambda, one plus lambda goes as T, so. Uh, well, uh, uh, yeah, so, um, no, I don't think so, but I, let me just show you what, like, uh, Yeah, so uh, so that's the mass as a function of temperature, and um, yeah, so that's experimentally what we measured. Heat capacity is has an enhancement. Yeah, so it kind of goes down. I was wrong. What's yeah. that? It goes yeah. down. It yeah, decreases. Yeah. So what about specific heat? It's the same same lambda at zero frequency that goes into specific heat. Yeah. So. Uh, what about it? I mean, it's it's enhanced. It's, yeah, it are you saying if I separate plot between frequency dependent uh, tau and what you get at zero frequency, but here it's resistivity. So within the same model, yeah. again, it's the same coupling at zero frequency. So. Right. But is, what's the question? Is the it, question was that if you attribute uh, difference between tau and resistivity to m star over m depending on frequency, depending on temperature, yeah. then shouldn't the same m star over m go into specific heat? Uh, w yeah, with some approximation or some assumptions about uh, yeah, the same mass. Yeah, some assumptions, yes. Yeah, but uh, you have data for specific heat. Yeah, so I didn't plot it on top, yeah, but, but it's roughly it's that. roughly on top. I mean, it the, the the mass enhancement is in the system goes up to um, and it goes down as a function. Yeah, I, mean, of I mean, part of part of the issue is that what the mass is that's measured here is ratio to the band mass, right? And we've made an assumption about the band mass. Yes. So based on LDA calculations. Fine, but if the you put this heat M capacity, star, I need to to get the heat capacity that typically we would express that in terms of the bare electron mass. No bend. But within same bend mass. Yeah. What's that? Same bend mass, I guess. Yeah. So within those, you know, with these kinds of uh, uncertainties, you know, the numbers are within thirty percent of each other. But I wouldn't say anything that the functional forms are. If that's what the question was yes, about. Yes, this was the question. Yeah, yes. no, I, yeah I'm not going to make a question about the functional forms. We could look at it. Yeah. 
Hi, yeah, I have a, actually a kind of related question to Andre's question. Uh, so can you go back to the slide about the frequency dependent scattering rate? Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to know how low in frequency that is relative to the temperature scale of the, so one terahertz is like 50 Kelvin, one right? One terahertz is 50 Kelvin. So yeah, the so. frequency scale, the lowest frequency scale here is around maybe 20 Kelvin? Uh, 15 yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah, 20 Kelvin. That's right. Yeah, but the T linear resistivity is only seen up to that temperature scale, right? So here, I guess the T, the omega square fit is always in the regime where omega is large, large, larger than or uh, of order T. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, you know that. That's I see. It. What's that? Yeah, that, that's true also, yeah. But um, yeah, so, so, so that's right, you know, but we, but I also should say that uh, that's the frequency dependence, but we also have a DC value as well. So there's a blue dot there, right? And so, you know, if you kind of believe that we should connect the low end of the actual frequency data to the DC data, that's, uh, you know, that looks like a reasonable place to draw the dashed line. Oh, I see. So that, the separate dot is the, is, DC. is the DC value. Yeah. I see. A uh, question from Chandra. Yeah, so if I didn't have the DC data, then indeed, who, who knows what it would be doing at the lowest frequencies, but I have DC data. Uh, yes, so uh, you underlined the relation between the masses extracted from specific heat and, and, and cyclotron resonance. Uh, I, I may have missed something, but could you elaborate on, on the relation between what you find for from cyclotron resonance and from quantum oscillations? Uh, there's no direct relation between that. I mean, within Fermi liquid theory, one expects that the mass inferred from quantum oscillations, say from Lustig Kosovich, is the same as the mass that you get from heat capacity. So you could call that the thermodynamic mass in both cases. You know, you ref, you know in this car, re reference Raghu's talk the other day, there was a mass that comes in to these thermodynamic quantities. So this mass is different from those. It could be the same-ish, uh, but but also can be different depending on the details. But you have no systematics on, on that? No, there's no, we have heat capacity data. We don't have any masses from quantum oscillations in lanthanum strontium copper oxide because there's no quantum oscillations in lanthanum strontium copper oxide. So it would be, so what... Um, so it would be good to have everything on, yes, on, on so a single experiments compound. Experiments that are, that are ongoing, in fact, we were trying to do them two weeks ago in Los Alamos, but there were some problems was looking at electron dope coupe rates, which is a system that's near and dear to my heart because I worked on my, my PhD thesis many years ago. Uh, quantum oscillations have been done there. Heat capacity has been done. And we think we can do the cyclotron resonance. And so that will be a really interesting thing to look at. Yeah. I'm Chandra Varmanel. Uh, Chandra has um, a question and a short comment. Um, the question is, what is the temperature dependence of the ratio tau over m? Assuming constant density. Tau over tau, uh, tau, not tau star. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Well, at any rate, tau, tau, tau over at, over a band mass. It's yeah. it goes linear in T. That's uh, not that data. It's uh, it's the next slide. Uh, uh, no. Yes. Yeah. So that's um, linear. So the DC. Let's say the DC data okay. is. Uh, uh, the comment is it may not be very meaningful to separate the two, maybe. Um, now I'm Lara Benfata. <laughs> uh, Lara Bas, uh, she asked about uh, the bits of, of the cyclotron of resonance gamma. Uh -huh. Do you have this? Yeah, okay, so uh, good, let me... Uh, Lara Benfata, yeah. Um, sorry, where is it? Oh, I didn't put, oh, there it is. Yeah, so this is, uh, let's say, just for the optimally doped sample that I first showed, this is the plot of the, the width of this feature. Uh, well, at the top, actually, it's the plasma frequency from the fit, so it's essentially a measure of this area as a function of magnetic field applied. Uh, blue is a sample which is just barely into the superconducting state, so you get a little bit of funny business at the lowest field on that blue point right there. I'm gonna use the pointer. Uh, but then we kill superconductivity right there, and then plasma frequency, which is here just basically the area of this is just flat. This is scattering rate as a function of magnetic field, and you can see that there's a field dependence. And so, um, 
I, and I think the way I understand this heuristically is that there's a frequency dependence to the scattering rate. And as I push spectral weight to high frequencies, I kind of, now it becomes a high energy phenomena and the scattering rate gets bigger. The question is, what's that functional dependence? And can we say something interesting about that? And I, and I don't have a comment on that now. With temperature, it goes up. With temperature. temperature, it goes up. But with field, it also goes up. If temperature goes up, that's kind of would be, I think, but obvious. Can you fit gamma as a function of T at a given field? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, mean, this could, I mean, can I get it to, uh, oh, that I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think we had a very nice discussion so far, and we can continue that during lunch break. Yeah. Uh, no. just, just please remind, uh, recall that there is uh, the, the concert, the private concert for us right after lunch, so please go ahead, and thanks, Gertrude, for chairing the session. Thank you.